Okay, good morning. Um, lovely to see lots of you. I've been aware of Dan Siegel for quite a long time. Um, he is the eminent voice now in child psychiatry, in neuro neurology. I'll just show you a little bit about him. This is his CV. And these are some of you, I showed you his books this morning. Um, I highly recommend them. Is anybody coming to the parent workshops that start next week? Um, great. Um, I, I said it's going to be a book club, and this is the book, it, the book it's going to be based on. This is The Whole Brain Child, and it's going to be the basis of the talk today. So I'm going to summarise him today and talk around a little bit uh, the book. And it's the parenting guide, but it, it, it's really based on how the brain works and how you can parent to integrate the different parts of the brain. And when you don't do that, why the kids are having tantrums, not cooperating, and all of that. The, the next book that Becky is going to uh, talk about some of the research in here is called Brainstorm. This is particularly for teenagers. And when we were talking, I was talking earlier, the teenage is a time of incredible development and restructuring. And the teenage brain does not finish developing until the age of 25. So um, it's a process and it's, it's a, a phenomenal restructuring. And I was, as I was saying to some parents earlier, this is an incredible time of creativity. Um, Becky's going to talk about that. Think of Mozart. Think of some incredible scientific discoveries. The people who made them were teenage brains. This is a phenomenal, they have phenomenal potential. But as, I, as we're going to show you, if they get hooked by their right brain, which is all emotion, then they can be pulled off course, okay? But their right brain is also the seat of their creativity. So we need to know how to integrate all of these processes. Right, so that was, that's those two books. And this book is a very deep understanding of all of what I'm going to talk to you today. And it's a transformational book for all of you to understand what's going on in your brain and how you can maximize your um, potential by integrating all the different parts of your brain. So I really strongly recommend all of this. Um, I got these books delivered from Book Depository. You can get them. Um, it takes a while, but it's really worthwhile. If you do want to join in the parent workshops on, uh, that start on Monday, the Monday afternoon from 2 till 3 in the junior library area, you're very welcome. If you don't have the book already, it's okay. You can join in anyway, but I recommend that you order it so that you can join in the discussions because um, there's a lot in there. Okay, so that's where we're coming from. So Dan Siegel, he has... He is an MD, trained in Harvard. He came up through, he decided to study and specialise in psychiatry, particularly young people. He's come up that way. He is a neurologist as well, does lots of research on the brain. He's an expert in mindfulness, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Mindfulness has nothing to do with spirituality, it's nothing to do with religion. It is an important skill. And we're trying to get this across to the children. You'll see why as I tell you about the structure of the brain. Okay. And those are the books. I will put this presentation out uh, this week in the newsletters. And also um, I'll, I'll do a little explanation of the talk that we're having this morning for parents who aren't able to make it. And you'll have all those references for you. Okay. So, um, Dan Siegel's come up with this wonderful model of the brain, very easy to understand. If you have children, even they're really young, you can show them this. The video is really for uh, people like me, therapists, people like that, to explain to um, you all and, to, and for myself as well, to understand how the human brain works. 
you can show it to kids. I've, we've shown it to quite a lot of teenagers, haven't we? And they really uh, appreciate seeing this. So I'm going to show you this little video now. It's a hand model of the brain. So this is the, the spinal cord, and he'll, he'll tell you about the rest. Okay. Now, you probably know the name Dan Siegel. He's one of the giants in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. And Dan came up with a lovely hand model of the human brain. So let's kind of go through the hand model of the brain. And this can be useful for you to understand, but at times it might be useful for you to actually share this with your client. The wrist of the forearm coming up to here is like your spinal cord. And Right here at the, uh, the end of the wrist is like the base of your skull. And here at the bottom of your palm, this is like the reptile brain, the life support system of the brain. So, you know, if the rest of your brain is wiped out through, say, for example, a stroke or a car accident, this life support part of your brain, the reptile brain, can still keep your body alive, can still keep all your organs functioning in your breath and your heart and so forth. This is where a lot of autonomic nervous system operates and stems from this reptile brain. Now, above the reptile brain is the mammalian brain, often called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. So reptiles, they've got the fight or flight response or they've got the freeze, shut down, flop and drop response, but they don't really have anything that is even remotely close to the, the complex emotional states that we see in mammals. And the limbic brain has many different parts to it, but two in particular that we'll be looking at in this course are the amygdala and the hippocampus. Now, don't worry about memorizing those terms for now, we will revisit them later. But this kind of is the, the middle brain, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, basically responsible for emotion. Now, on top of the limbic mammalian emotional brain, you've got the cerebral cortex, the thinking cap of the brain. The cerebral cortex is much thicker in mammals, but especially so in primates, and particularly so in human beings, more so than any other primate. And this cerebral cortex, the thinking part of the brain, is responsible for consciousness and cognition. And right at the front of the cerebral cortex, you have the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right up here at the front of your forehead, above your eyes, and particularly important to us is the medial prefrontal cortex. This bit in the middle, right at the front, this bit up here, this plays a very important role in mindfulness and awareness. So let's do go through it again. You've got your spinal cord, you've got your reptile brain, underneath your cerebral cortex, you've got your mammalian brain with the amygdala and hippocampus responsible for emotions, and then you've got your cerebral cortex, your thinking cap of the brain on top, and the medial prefrontal cortex right here in the center of the foot, right there. So, that's the structure of the brain. So basically, as we've evolved over time from the reptiles, we, uh, have, developed, uh, we have different levels of our brain, and actually human beings are the ones with the most developed um, cortex, cerebral cortex, and the cerebral cortex is our thinking part and it's our awareness part, and we are the only primates that have what we would call consciousness. So this is where it's uh, seated. Now, it's the last thing to develop, so the young child doesn't have, the baby doesn't have consciousness, it's not born with it. Um, it goes through a massive development during childhood, and then so you basically have all the neurons that you need by the time you get to uh, adolescence, but during adolescence, as Becky's going to show you later, there's a massive restructuring um, to make this brain much more efficient. So we're going to talk about that later. As well as the vertical brain, where you've got your reptilian, mammalian, and your cortex, you also have a horizontal brain have the left and right hemisphere. The right hemisphere tend, uh, tends, is very closely linked to those lower brain areas. Um, the right hemisphere, I've just got some mnemonics here because I like, um, yeah, I, I think it makes more sense. I made myself a little poster to remind myself. 
people and things I want to say. It's holistic, it's non-verbal, um, right hemisphere, it sees the big picture, it's really connected to feelings, the meaning of things, memories, images, emotions, um, it's personal, it's based on experience, your experiences get locked down there, um, and when you get triggered by something, all these embedded memories start to come out, um, and it's autobiographical, it's that feeling state, that's all located in your right hemisphere, and a wonderful child, Neve, who um, is, a, is in year two, I was talking, oh, you know, do you know about the right brain and the left brain? She said, yes. She said, the right brain is your barking dog. And she said, and your left brain is your wise owl. And she learned this in the yoga class. I thought it was absolutely perfect description. It's not just the barking dog, it's the overexcited dog, the over emotional dog, the over playful dog. It's, 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 that's your right brain. Um, your left brain, like she said, is the, left, the wise owl. It's logical, literal, linguistic, linear, and it loves lists. It loves the letter of the law. It loves putting things in order. It loves using words. It loves logic. Now, what, we, you, what we're going to be talking about today is how you can parent so that when your child is completely engulfed by its right brain, that you can parent by using, by getting them to engage their left. When they are being very rigid and seem to be unfeeling, how you can connect them to the right brain, which is where you're going to develop their empathy, kindness, generosity and all of that. So it's integration. And then we've got this integration going on as well, uh, um, vertically. So remember that the lower brain structures, they tend to trigger off this right brain. So this is what is explained in the book, and I'm just going to be trying to be as simple as I can this morning, just to give you an overview of all of this, okay? Right. Um, yeah, in young kids, we know that the right hemisphere is dominant because, you know, the end, do you remember when they were really, really small? and they're just endlessly fascinated by things and just start and just get out involved in it. Um, their left brain is not sort of like, you know, um, telling them, no, no, it's time to do this, it's time to do that. They're just very open and aware. This is a wonderful part of the brain. and We all have it and we need to reconnect with it to develop our awareness and curiosity. So that's, it's, it's not that the right brain is inferior to the left brain because less logical, it's not, not that at all. Um, we know that the left brain starts to come in when your child starts saying to you, but why, 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 why? Do you remember that stage? That's when their left hemisphere is beginning to develop. So very young children, right hemisphere dominated because they're also, those lower brain functions are much more important and active at that stage because the the cortex is not developed. And then as they get older, the cortex develops and the left hemisphere starts to become more uh, active. Okay, so that's just to remind us of the wise owl and the barking dog. So, when your brain is disintegrated, that means it's not working together. Uh, Dan Siegel says it's like this. You flip your lid. So what does it look like? Tantrums, they're overwhelmed with emotions, and this applies to us as well. Feeling confused, really, really stressed, with chaotic behavior, aggressive behavior. You see this a lot in adolescence. They get very angry, feels like their emotions are totally out of control, all of this. Um, having meltdowns, or you know, if they've got a race, or if they've got an exam, or anything. Um, now, just be careful, though, because we can say, okay, this is, this is their right brain, it's not their fault, then they're being also um, stimulated by their lower brain organs, they, the, the structures, they feel anxious for some reason, they feel threatened for some reason, that's what's triggering it. Possibly, 
But sometimes the left brain says, hey, if I have a tantrum right now, mom's going to give in. So they're not necessarily being triggered by all these emotions. They just, it's learned behavior, and they know if they kick off, you're going to give in. So when you're parenting, you've got to be tuned into your child to know, is this a genuine meltdown because they're completely overwhelmed, or are they playing me here? So, you know, be careful of this information because it can make you a little bit too, um, yeah. Anyway, so if you think about the brain uh, uh, model, the hand model, what happens is that this part, the limbic area, which is the seat of all this um, very, very uh, high emotion, which is difficult to control, starts becoming very agitated, okay? And they have the cortex, but what happens is this becomes so agitated, the, co the cortex, you they literally flip your lid. The cortex comes offline and they, they're unable to rationalize, they're unable to function. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is how we can bring it back online. Um, I, I, I know in previous parenting talks I've talked to you about there is no point talking to your child when they are completely out of control. You do it later. Um, I, that's still the case because when, you, when there's no point, you can't connect with a structure that is not online. But what we're going to teach you today is how to get it back online so that you can start, um, you know, talking to them, rationalizing with them, getting them to connect their two sides of their brain to calm themselves down, okay? So when all parts are working together, the sort of, the, the, the idea is that it's like a river and you are in the middle of the river. You're not too far to the left brain, which is about rigidity, superstructure. I get a lot of students coming to see me. I have to be an A-star student. I have to be this. I have to do that. I have to do that. That's very left brain, and it causes a lot of stress. There's no flexibility. There's no creativity in that, and it causes an awful lot of stress if they're very, very rigid. On the if they're far too far to the right brain, it can be chaotic, they're in the rapids, they're freaking out, and all of that. So what we want to do is to be able to integrate the two sides so that they're in what we call the river of well-being. Okay? Um, so the first strategy, and I wanted just to show you uh, Dan Siegel talking to um, a parent about the first strategy that he talks about, so you get to see him in a little bit. Not a brilliant video in terms of the quality, but what he says is, is very good. So I'm going to just show you him, and then I'm going to talk you through the other strategy. Any questions so far? Is this very complicated and you don't understand, or is it okay? I'm, it's okay. I'm not a neurologist at all. Um, you know, my understanding of all of this is from working with students and from books and integrating all of my knowledge, but I am not at all a scientist, so please, if, if it's confusing, do let me know. If a toddler, for instance, is having a tantrum about having to leave the sand pit after being there for quite some time, and their mother wants them to come in, and you know, things need to be done, dinner needs to be served, and so on, and they've just let go. What's happening in terms of left and right brain? When you say let go, you mean uh, they're getting upset? They're getting upset. It's That's an Aussie term for getting upset? Yeah, it's, it's not a perfect situation for, for the mother. <laughs> yeah, got it. So they flip their lid. So one thing, one thing to understand is that when the cortex, the upstairs brain, isn't working with the lower areas, the downstairs limbic area and brain stem, you, when they stop working together, we call that flipping your lid. So when you flip your lid, you 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 said let go, you know, and now your your behavior is coordinated. You're not very respectful to others. You may not be very insightful for yourself. Your emotions are exploding like a volcano. You may even get rigid. So the bottom line is, you become either chaotic, 
out of control, unpredictable, or rigid, completely unmoving, totally predictable. So what's interesting about this is chaos and rigidity are two banks along a river. It's the river of integration, which is harmony. And when you get out of integration, you either go to chaos or you go to rigidity. So what's really exciting about that is as a parent, you're given a very basic notion. You watch for chaos or rigidity, and when it arises in your family, you know that integration is being, let's say, compromised. So it isn't like there's something wrong, it's not like someone has a disease or something like that. It just means that there's a moment, an opportunity, an invitation for you as a parent to go, ah, my child is letting go, they're flipping, their, 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 they're losing their mind, they're off the handle, whatever phrase you like to use. You know integration is impaired, so the first thing you do is you connect before you try to redirect. Because if you try to redirect without connecting, you, the brain basically has two fundamental states. You can be either receptive or reactive. You want to help your reactive child, whether they're chaotic or rigid. This reactive state is a state of non-integration. You want to connect with them there. Wow, it's really upsetting to want to leave the sandbox when you're having so much fun. And you may even sit down at your child's level or get below your child's level and just say, you know something, I'd like to stay here all day too. And you just go, hmm. and your child looks at you like, I so reflect their behavior. You're reflecting their behavior, you're connecting with them. You're saying, I understand how you feel. Now, once your child has what a patient mind calls feeling felt, then they relax, they become receptive, and you go, I'd like to stay here all day. Maybe we could even dig a little hole and sleep here tonight. Maybe we could eat the sand for dinner. And your child goes, no, I'm hungry. No, I think we'll just you can play with it, have fun with it. And you go, yeah, I know we've got to have dinner, the sun is going down, we're going to get tired, we need to, you need to take a bath, it's going to be time for dinner. So you know something? We can come back tomorrow morning and play here, and I want to build the biggest sand cast you've ever seen. Why don't we bring a bucket? No, let's bring two buckets. Yeah, let's bring two buckets, and then we're going to do it. So you connect it, and now you leave this in park. It's so sad when you see a parent grab the kid's arm and just yank them out. And you know, sometimes that's necessary if your child's running into a street and you don't want them to run over. You have to do that. But you know, there are lots of playful ways of creating a yes in parenting that actually creates structure and gets you where you want to be with just a little bit of thought and a couple of extra seconds rather than a no. You know, that so many parents do, no, no, no. And it creates this feeling inside that's very uncomfortable. So that's what we want to promote in this mindset approach to parenting. And I guess also, with all of this, as I said before, the book centers on some family integration. So we need to be integrated in order to identify the chaos or anything that's happening as well. Exactly. We really do, you know, and, and when you have that kind of presence of mind, it, it's a beautiful thing when you see parents get it, because the whole idea of this approach, which began with parenting from the inside out, with Mary Hartzell, and then with my student now colleague Tina Bryson, we've gone into whole brain child, no drama discipline, and then I wrote a book for adolescents called Brainstorm. Those four parenting books, you know, they're really trying to empower parents. Okay, so connect. The most of you're connecting with what? Right brain or left brain when they're having a tantrum? Which? Right. You're connecting with their right brain. I get you, I understand you, I know. Are, are you feeling this? Are you feeling angry? Are you feeling sad? I get why you're feeling like that. Same with adolescents. I really understand like how frustrating it is. Like you're in the middle of the game and you and I'm telling you to turn it off. I get that. Yeah? I understand. I can imagine anyway. I don't play games my phone. But I can imagine how frustrated you are. Um, you know, get the name, name the emotions. You know, name the emotions. Because, uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second, but uh, so connect with them. When you connect with them, immediately, you are, and, and one, some of the things you might need to do is put your arm around them. Do you remember, I talked about this before, when you touch a child, it gives them a hormone called oxytocin, which is 
uh, the same hormone that they get when they're bonding with the mother during breastfeeding, they get that. You get that still. You can touch yourself as well if you're feeling upset. But it really helps. It really, really helps. You might put your arm around them and say, look, you're feeling upset at the moment. I get that. I really understand. So they start to feel like you understand them. After that, you're going to start redirecting. So when you redirect, you are engaging the left brain. So the next uh, one is you, strategy is you name it. So you start to bring the left hemisphere into the atmosphere, into the picture. You want them to say, for example, they've had a horrible experience or a horrible day and they're ranting about it. You want them to talk to you about it. You want them to talk you through the whole event because what you're doing is you're activating the left brain. Um, I, if I, a student came to see me the other day. Um, they are in the sixth form now. There, something happened to them, very serious happened to them when they were about six. Um, the maid found out, told the parents, the member of staff involved was sacked. The parents have never spoke to the child about it. She's now in the sixth form and told me about it. And it's been, she's never told anyone else. This is a memory that has been eating away at her for all these years. And it, if she hadn't met me, maybe she would never have talked about it until she was an adult. And it's eating away at her. And it's causing her problems in her life. We have to talk about things with kids. Why? Because they start to integrate their experiences with their left and their right. It doesn't get locked down in their right brain and cause them problems. If kids have a difficult experience, it can develop into a phobia. It can develop into an, a disorder. You know, it can develop into all sorts of problems. So what we need to do is integrate difficult experiences by talking through them, naming the emotions that go with them. Um, you know, an adult that I work with um, says, that they're angry, and actually what they mean is they're upset and sad. We don't, you know, and that's an adult, very high functioning adult. They don't, people are not connected, we don't go to the we don't talk to our kids, we don't engage with our friends, so we need to do that. Um, so tell the story. Okay, tell me about what happens at school today. Let's, and, and you know, yesterday, just Yesterday, I took year seven, and at the end, we had three quarters of an hour to talk. And uh, we were talking about because the whole day was about my, being mindful, working on focus, attention, awareness. And I said, Somebody said, But when I talk, my parents are not listening. And I said, What do you mean? And they say, Well, you know, I'm talking, but I can tell they're not listening to me. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Either their brain is thinking something else, or on their mobile phones, or they're on their computer, or they're making dinner, or they're attending to a million things at the same time, but you're not connecting with them, and they know it. Like when, um, and a lot of the, the kids go online and don't connect with me sometimes, and I say this to them, this is what mindfulness is about. You're looking at me as if you're listening, but I can see you're not. Because you're, you're listening to your brain, you're listening to your thoughts, you're not listening to me. Um, and this is what we need to develop. Is this, you know, if they need to feel heard, then they're going to connect and they're going to be able to, you're going to be able to integrate all of this stuff. Um, next strategy he talks about is engaging and not enraging. So you're going to, you, what you want to do is start to engage this upstairs brain, the, the cerebral cortex, rather than enrage the, uh, the the structures below. So, when they're kicking off, the worst thing you can do is use your lower structures or your right brain to shout back and give them ultimatums. And I'm the boss here, not you. I'm, you know, all of that. Because when you react like that, that is your right brain. You feel annoyed, you feel threatened, you feel like your authority is in question and all of that. 
you've been triggered by your right brain, you are not using your left brain. That is the worst thing. That is like throwing fuel onto the fire. Let's all use our right brain and let's have a screaming, slanging match that's going to go nowhere. So, does this sound familiar? I know it does, because I wish I knew this when I was bringing my kids up, but never mind. We got there without this knowledge, unfortunately. I think instinctively, though, there are things that you know you do which are about this. Like, you know, you know when you're having that great conversation with your child and you are connecting with them. You know when you're using your left brain and they're starting to engage them. There's, this is, I'm sure this is not completely new to you, but this is what's going on in the brain at the same time. So, yeah, so engage their, their cortex. Start speaking to them with that. You, in order for them to be able to do that, they need to exercise their brain so that it functions properly. So you need to teach them. You know, in the book, they've got loads and loads of things that you can share with your kids. Cartoons about the brain. Um, they've got, at the back of, the, of this book, they've got um, things, a list of things that you can stick on your fridge so you know what's going on at any time to, ah, this is what's happening. And you, you can share it with your kids. Um, and there's, as I say, there's cartoons about the brain and things like that that you can share with the children at their level. Teach them about, about all of that. We're trying to teach all the children to control their uh, body uh, when we teach them mindfulness. We teach to because when you control your breathing, everything starts to get under control. When you control your breathing, your heart rate comes down, your, and when you control your breathing, your limbic system, that middle brain, it starts to calm down because your breathing is calming down, and you start to squirt these calming neurotransmitters into that part of your brain. So just by teaching them to control their breathing, you're getting them to get more control over their emotions. Um, the, get them to engage their left brain. Yeah, the, the, a couple of days ago, I had a student I was talking to them about all of this. They were completely flipped out. They wanted to have a session with me all morning because they couldn't cope and all the rest of it. And I said, you know, you need to engage your left brain when you're feeling like this. When you woke up this morning feeling like life wasn't worth living, if you have a journal next to you, write stuff down, do bullet points, make lists about everything. Get it out. But what you're actually doing is engaging your left brain. Your left brain can calm your right brain down. Okay? This is what we need to over journaling and over going um, over ruminating that is not great. He said to me, Can I can't I draw? And I said, No. Think about what you know about the brain. What is drawing? Which side of the brain is drawing? That's for a right brain activity. We no, we're gonna get a left brain activity, but calm your right brain down. So journaling is really, really good, writing things down. Um, you need to teach empathy um, by Talking about other people's emotions. You know, do you see when they reacted like that? Why do you think that is? Why do you think they reacted like that at that time? You know? Or if you react in a way, in a certain way to something, share with them why you reacted like that. You know, I reacted like, I overreacted that time. I'm sorry. It was because I was triggered, you know, because this happened, that happened, and it reminded me of this, or it reminded me of that. You have to teach kids empathy. They don't just learn it. And it's, a, it's an upstairs brain activity. It's a complex thing, empathy. But this is what we need kids to have. Um, and morality as well. They don't just get it. Discuss hypothetical situations. Right, if you found, you know, that money, and no one... Uh, if, it looked like it didn't belong to anybody, what would you do about that? You know, what about if someone was bullying someone at school? How would you, what would you, how would you deal with that? What would you do? What would you do? What would be the right thing to do? And come up with, you know, lots of hypothetical situations so that they're prepared. Um, right, when they really, really are um, in a bit of a state, 
the thing that calms them down is moving. So, you know, with your crazy, I remember my brother just getting into these rages and everybody would go like, take the dog for a walk, just get out of the house, take the dog for a walk, and we take the dog for a walk, come back and he's a human being again. You know, get them moving. Go out, do something, go outside and kick the ball. You know, what happens is the brain chemistry gets uh, soothed. So the, again, it's the chemical structure moving, starts squirting these, um, it, it, I can't remember the name of it, it's this gamma something. Um, it, it's like a nice soothing gel and it soothes these parts of the brain. It's a chemical reaction. By moving, you're soothing brain down. Right. The memory gets, remember it's, 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 it's in that right brain and anything in life can trigger our memories and it's, okay, it's not like a filing cabinet. I know I'll show pictures of filing because when you're asleep you need to file. That's your long-term memory system. But it's an association machine. So you're doing something that's not related, or you know, you've had this experience, I have it all the time, that's not related at all to this thing that suddenly pops into your mind. And then, it, it, for example, especially as you get older, you know, you lose people, events happen, all sorts of things. And you, for example, have you ever had that thing where suddenly a record comes on on the radio and you're transported back to something emotional? or you smell something, and it reminds you of a time when. These memories are embedded, and they can, and they're associated. The other thing about memory is, it's not like a photocopy machine. It gets distorted, it gets changed, because there's an emotional quality to it. So it gets exaggerated, or minimalized, or all sorts of things. So your memory is not exactly the same as the event. Um, and these past experiences can influence your behaviour in the present, they can influence your emotional state. Like I say, you get, we, I use the language with kids, you get hooked by things, you get hooked by things. And some of them are not um, necessarily, you're not necessarily conscious of it either, they're implicit, not explicit. They're not explicit memories, but they're just a feeling. You get this feeling. I get kids all the time come in and say, I just feel, just this morning I woke up and just felt like that. Okay? This is where this, is, this sort of thing is coming from. Um, if, you, if they've been through something very, very difficult, what he suggests is imagining that their brain is like a remote control. So you can press stop at any time when you're really telling a story. You can skip over the difficult part get them to tell the story, and they can come back to it later. You, you get to the end, you can come back to it later. Um, the other thing is, work the memory by developing opportunities in your family to, to, to go over memories, to talk about things, take films of important events that you want and show them over again, have photographs up on the walls and things like that. These are all really, really important devices to get the kids to uh, work on their memory and to make meaning of all of the experiences that they've had. And again, this is about integration, it's getting the brain to work effectively together. Right, this is really, really important. And this is why we practice mindfulness at school. The kids need to understand that feelings come and go. Thoughts come and go. What happens when we get hooked by them, we, we call it getting fused with these things, we believe that it's part of ourselves. So when we have the thought, I'm not good enough, you think, that is true. But I'm having that thought all the time, there's truth in this, I'm not good enough, right? And then all the associated feelings go with that. What I try and teach the kids is to, to say, oh, I'm having a thought, I'm not good enough. I notice I'm having a thought, I'm not good enough. But when you do that, you stand away from it. 
You don't fuse with it, believe it. You don't believe, oh, that person doesn't like me. You haven't had that, that person doesn't like me, right? Oh, I'm having thought that person doesn't like me. I notice I'm having thought that person doesn't like me. You're then not going to ignore that person because you think that's true or be unkind to that person because you think that they've got a problem with you. You realise that it's a thought. And unfortunately, and I say this to the, you know, we, we have evolved from the negative caveman who was looking for danger everywhere. So we have negative thoughts constantly. Negative, 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 dripping down all the time. If your kids believe all of that stuff, well, it's going to end up in a lot of difficulties and problems. It's also connected to social media now. We're all on social media and we're constantly being bombarded with criticism and judgment and validation or non-validation. I had a student who was absolutely crucified because she didn't get as many likes as her friends. And, and you think that's ridiculous. But for her, it's the end of the world. And it just went round and round and round her head. So we need to know this skill of that feelings will come and go and um, their states, not traits, they come and go. We need the skill of mindfulness to, to yes. stand back from all of that. Um, being aware of what is going on inside our brain. So we've talked about, um, I'm, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Um, sensations in the body. Sensations in the body give us feedback. The feedback, if we ha are having, a, so a good example, I had a student who was having regular panic attacks. She was in a changing room and she was putting on a tight jumper and she got stuck under the jumper, she couldn't get it off. So she was getting a bit hot and then her heart rate went up. So because she noticed that, um, and she's so sensitive to bodily changes, because she noticed that her heart rate went up and she was getting hot, her brain told her she was having a panic attack. When her brain told her she was having a panic attack, her heart rate went up more, she got hotter, and she ended up having a panic attack. So, we, they need, if she was aware, okay, I'm hot because I'm in uh, a changing room and I'm stuck under my jumper, right? My heart rate's gone up because I'm, you know, struggling with this, right? She wouldn't have spiraled into this situation. So they need to be aware of the sensations that are going on in their body. That's useful information, but they also need to be able to discriminate so that they make a logical conclusion. They need to be aware of the images, memories, and things that are triggering them. So they need to be aware of that. They need to be aware of feelings and be specific, like my friend who says he's angry when actually he's upset, hurt. You know? They need to be aware of that. And they need to be aware of their thoughts. This is really important. When your kids or you go on a mind trip, be aware. Where are you going? What are you thinking of right now? If you want your kids to be effective learners and effective human beings in terms of their relationships and everything, they need to be able to connect with people, not just be inside their own heads. So this is really, really important. Um, and this is... So they need to be in this calm hub. Now, on the outside rim is everything that happens to them. This is, this is what he calls mind sight and is really described in incredible detail in here. So rather than mindfulness, we call it mind sight. That integrates everything. Um, mindfulness is the practice of the, this is, is the practice of mind sight. Mind sight is knowing what's going on inside your brain and having being the master of it instead of it being the master of you. So, being able to return back to this calm place in the middle and see what's going on around the rim. So, the rim is anything we pay attention to, including our thoughts, our feelings, dreams, desires, memories, anything that we pay attention to. Our bodies, what's going on in our bodies, perceptions, everything, all our senses. In the hub, we can see, we know what's going on around us. And so, if we know, we can decide we're going to pay attention to this, the teacher talking, you know, or we're going to pay attention to our thoughts and memories, 
or we're going to pay attention to what's going on in our body, we have control because we're in this calm place in the center. So this is what um, we're trying to develop in the kids and what I'll be teaching in the parent class is about how you can integrate these things so that the kids develop this. Um, it's really important to have lots of fun with kids because you are in, and fun in your relationships because what you're doing is you are setting a precedent in their brain physiologically, um, a model of how they can relate to other human beings throughout their life. These are models that they're going to take with them for the rest of their life. And if they argue, um, you need to teach them certain skills. All kids argue, and you need to encourage them to use mind sight skills. So they need to recognize other people's points of view. Um, use the we instead of um, how, why, um, how did it happen? Why did he react like that? Why did she uh, kick off when you said this? What was going on in her mind? All of those sort of things. Um, teach them about nonverbal communication and attuning to other people. Okay, they said you could have that biscuit, but did you see the face? She, did. she wasn't happy about it, was she? You know, you really upset her when you insisted, you know? Um, and teach them how to make things right. I'm going to have to speed through because I know Becky's got to do some stuff. Um, discipline means teaching them. It doesn't mean punishing them. It's a, it's a teaching point. So consequences. You know what? You really upset her and you did the wrong thing there. You know, brainstorm with her. What should you do about that? What should you do to make up? I, I'm just going to talk about adolescence very briefly. Very briefly, we've got another. I know because we've got to wind up. And we've got to do. It. Good morning, everybody. I'm um, Becky, and I'm the assistant counsellor, and I'm just going to be talking a little bit about adolescence. It will be a very brief overview, but hopefully it will be helpful. And it's from the other book that Dancy was going to brainstorm. So adolescence runs from roughly the age of 12 to 24. And it's just part of a normal process of healthy changes in the brain. Um, it's known across all cultures that it can be a very difficult time period for both the adolescent and the adults that support the adolescent. Um, but it's important to note that um, it's not just a period of time that you're trying to just get through and survive. It's a really good time for young people to thrive. Um, and as Claire said before, it's a perfect time to be in, in creative and have lots of innovations at that age. Um, it's known that it's a time where adolescents will try and test boundaries, um, but also it's important to note that they also have a passion to explore the unknown as well, um, and that can develop core character traits that can lead to great lives and purpose. So executive function, um, that just describes the capacity that allows us to control and coordinate our and behaviour. So the examples here are selective attention, decision making, voluntary response inhibition, and working memory. So all of these play a part in um, cognitive control. So things like being able to filter out unimportant information, being able to hold in mind plans for the future, and being able to um, inhibit any impulses. This all happens in the prefrontal lobes in the brain is highlighted there in the diagram. Um, this is actually the last part of the brain um, to develop and it continues to develop all the way through adolescence. So all of these functions are still developing up to the mid-20s. Um, so that can be a sign of some of the behaviours that you might see in adolescence. So dopamine and decision making. So dopamine release peaks during adolescence and this is the hormone that um, creates the feeling of reward. So there's an increased drive for reward because there's a peak in dopamine during this time. Um, as a result of that, teenagers, adolescents tend to seek um, brilliant experiences and um, maybe have risky behaviours or behaviours that maybe seem unsafe. Um, 
So increased impulsiveness, that's just an action without cause. So that's just exhibiting a behaviour without having that time for thoughtful reflection and not considering all the options and just acting before considering that. The susceptibility to addiction is related to dopamine and adolescence because any behaviour or substance that's addictive um, is involved in the release of dopamine. So if we stop engaging in that behaviour or with that substance, dopamine plummets and then we're driven to then seek out that behaviour or that substance again to get that rise in dopamine and that good feeling and that feeling of reward. So again, that's why adolescents, because they've got that increased dopamine level, they're more likely to engage in those kind of behaviours or with those substances. It's also important to note that food can be included in this. So the processed foods or foods with high sugar, um, they also trigger um, a rapid increase in dopamine and that feeling of reward. So that cycle goes around again where they will then seek out those types of foods um, to get that feeling of reward and that release of dopamine, which is then now becoming quite a bad situation with adolescents in the sense of obesity um, and people putting on weight at that age group. Um, Hyper-rationality, um, it's about not seeing the bigger picture. So very often adolescents will be aware of the risks involved in an action or a behaviour and maybe sometimes they'll overestimate the risk as well. But what happens is that the negative consequences are outweighed by this reward. Um, so the cons are outweighed by the pros. So they will still go ahead with that behaviour. So integrating the brain. Um, in childhood, um, we have an overproduction of neurons and synapses. And that's because when we're younger and we're developing, um, we want to try and learn as much um, as we possibly can, anything and everything. Um, but there's then this process during adolescence called pruning. Um, happens around the, it starts happening around the age of 11 and 12. I believe it starts younger in girls, so more around 11 for girls and 12 for boys. Um, and this is just genetically controlled, but it can also be shaped by experience in the sense that excess connections are pruned away in the brain, and that's often dictated by um, a focus or a passion um, that that individual will have um, in their adolescent years. So it's the perfect time to focus on um, learning a musical instrument, learning a new skill, um, learning a new sport, um, because as these connections are not being used to get improved away, it will strengthen the connections um, related to those skills. And myelination is when a myelin sheath is um, created, which basically um, increases the electrical flow between the neurons and synapses that have been strengthened during pruning. Um, so it just allows for a faster, more efficient process, um, which then results in wiser judgments and decision making, rather than the need for reward before or the literal thinking that a child would have. This lady who's been very patient is going to speak to you, and uh, I'm, I'm aware that we're running out of time. We will share the, um, the talk with you, and you'll be able to access the video that we weren't able to show you about um, adolescence. Um, basically, do you want to, and then the, the slide there on the, on the essence of adolescence, what Becky was basically saying was that this is an incredible time of development and this pruning process it's like a tree that's got too much many branches and it will it will be weakened if we leave all those branches on it they get pruned back so that the tree gets stronger and stronger and that the branches that are left are very very strong and they work exceptionally well and that the tree is really really healthy this is the process that happens during adolescence and it's a time but again as she said, it's a time when they've got this dopamine thing going on so they can get hooked on things because they get dopamine, computer games, 
social media, food, smoking, drinking, all of those things, driving fast in a car, thrilling activities, all of those, right up to the age of 25, it's a risky period. My son has got to the age of 30, I think he had a longer process than everybody else, and he's just given everything up, he's become more clean and wonderful, and I'm so grateful to whoever is upset. <laughs> Thank you.